I appreciate all of you coming this evening um, to listen to this auditory processing lecture, either because you lost a bet or you have interest in this for some reason, whether it's a child that you know with some issues that are related to auditory processing, or uh, if you're a teacher slash SLP. So anyway, this is my very favorite thing to talk about. I actually heard about it the first time at a lecture similar to this one in April of 2004. So uh, I, I went to this lecture and my life changed because all of a sudden things started to make sense to me that hadn't made sense before. It wasn't like hearing about auditory processing for the first time. It was recognizing something that I've always known. Um, I struggled with auditory processing myself and had I not recognized it and gotten involved with it, I'm not sure that I would have finished my trifecta of degrees from KU. So um, it's a very personal subject to me, and it's very powerful because it can really change the lives of others once, once things have been addressed. So we'll talk about auditory processing and kind of four different things related to processing. We'll talk about what the actual diagnosis is, what it means, um, talk about how we test for it, we'll talk about therapy strategies that we use in order to combat specific issues, and then last but not least, we'll talk pretty pragmatically about things that you can do on a daily basis with your individual youngster or your group of youngsters that will hopefully help increase, um, increase comprehension, I almost said increase frustration, uh, <laughs> hopefully this will help you decrease frustration and increase so first of all, the quick and slick. Auditory processing is what our brain does with what our ears hear. So when we typically have hearing tests, when we're listening for the beeps, beep, 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 many people think, oh, that's what audiologists do. We're, we're those beep guys. Um, but obviously, this isn't telling us how we're really understanding. It's telling us the quietest we hear each pitch. So it gives us a nice roadmap to see what pitches are actually able to be heard by the person. So this denotes sensitivity. Okay? And by the way, I would be happy to send you all of these slides so that you don't have to write down everything. Um, I would love for you to be able to actually listen, but feel free to doodle and take notes as you like. Um, Dr. Jack Katz, who I mentioned here, is um, the person who was speaking when I went on April, uh, April of 2004. He quickly became my mentor, and he's a good friend. Come on in. Oh, no, I'm scared. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, very scary today. Um, so anyway, Jack Katz is a phenomenal man. Um, he is well known for his work in auditory processing research, and um, as far as diagnosis and treatment, I've been really lucky that his grandchildren lived in Kansas City because when he came here to retire, I really, really got a great teacher who had some extra time. So when there's an error in the process of being able to understand what's going on, that's an auditory processing disorder. Auditory processing isn't a bad thing to have, but an auditory processing disorder, that's where things um, are tricky. So the ability is auditory processing, um, also, you may have heard of auditory processing mentioned as CAPD, CAPD, or Central Auditory Processing Disorder. Those of us in the know pretty much call it APD and keep it at that. Um, Central kind of put too much of a focus for what was going on with the, with the disorder. So, back to that hearing testing idea. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 beep. beep. Even if you set, hear the sounds, even when they're really, really quiet, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to interpret their meaning. Now, if you've ever gone on a trip to a foreign country where they speak English, but maybe they have a little bit more of an accent, and it's hard to interpret how they're saying things, or if you've ever spoken another language and you're constantly trying to interpret things, you'll understand how it feels to have a processing deficit. Now, if you, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have that, 
because that's not your dialect. That's not, you weren't, you weren't raised hearing it that way. But if you were raised hearing it that way and you still have that much of a difficult time understanding what people are say, saying, then maybe, um, then maybe you might have a processing problem. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right. So typical versus non-typical auditory processing. All right, when I'm talking right now, each sound in each word that I'm saying is 40 milliseconds long. That's four hundredths of a mill, or four hundredths of a second long. All right, so just the dip in the in the word dog, it's much shorter than what I just did there. It is only four or four. 40 milliseconds long. So typically developing children can understand these sounds even at that short amount of uh, length 90% of the time. Kids with auditory processing deficit can understand 90% of so sounds that are 450 milliseconds long, which is a whole half a second. So, oh great, they can get it in a whole half of a second but as soon as it gets below 100, they're only getting 65% of that. So if we think about how these initial building blocks are not coming through to them accurately, they're not coming through to them clearly, then how in the world are they supposed to take it to a larger extent, to generalize it to larger words and things like that? I think that's pretty, pretty amazing, and that's in quiet. So, there are a bunch of symptoms and warning signs. Perhaps you've seen somebody with these issues. I know that I certainly recognize some of them myself. Um, warning signs and factors, family history of auditory processing issues. I can tell you that I was not the very first generation with auditory pro with processing problems. Um, and this is most likely due to a, um, a lot of chronic ear infections a lot of middle ear infections as I was young, as the rest of my family was young. It is highly, highly comorbid with dyslexia, TBI, um, autism spectrum, and whenever somebody tells me that someone's a selective listener, I take it slightly more serious than the average cat. Okay, so prevalence. How often is this happening? Um, some people are saying two to three percent, others are saying 10 to 20 percent of children have APD. That means that you all know someone, at least. I would guess that if, just in my experience, probably 20 percent have it to a milder extent, and then it's kind of a gradient, um, and only a, a, a smaller percentage has it pretty severely. All right, so it can look like ADHD, but this is, but it's only caused with difficulty with auditory verbal input, not with attention alone. All right, these kids, they may look like they're not paying attention after a full day in school, or maybe even a half an hour in school, um, but, but that may be because they are so overwhelmed with what they're hearing that they shut down. Now, fortunately, lots of these kids don't have behavior issues on top, so they're not, um, they're not necessarily disrupting class. Sometimes they do, sometimes that is an issue as well. Um, but things are ADHD and auditory processing, these are not mutually exclusive. It's not like, oh, he doesn't have ADD, he only has APD. There could be, there could be that situation, there could also be a 